Hey, welcome to Red Lemon TV, and I'm Steve Follin. We're chatting today to Connor Whelan, who is in Ireland. It's amazing. There, he there he is. Uh, awesome animator, causing quite a stir at the moment with My Darling's Shadow, which is his new uh, short film, I think is probably the word that does it justice. Yeah, very short. Very <laughs> it's a, but just to call it a video, that's not or you know, an anime. It's a, it is a short film. An animated folly, let's call it. <laughs> Just a warning, if you're watching this and you haven't seen My Darling Shadow, uh, spoiler alert, okay, no, doubtless, there's bound to be yeah. some, right? So seriously, hit pause, go watch it, we'll put a link below or whatever, but watch the video, uh, watch the film, and then come back and hear Connor chat about, because we're basically, this is the idea we're going to specifically chat about at the making of that video, so go and watch it now. Meanwhile, I'll turn the dishwasher off. <laughs> <laughs> So, man, where do we start? How long did it take you for uh, to to start with? It took about a year, but it probably should have taken a lot less than that because I was really lazy. And, uh, <laughs> and it was a personal project as well, so I was only doing it in the evenings and weekends and stuff, you know. So it's really hard to be motivated to come home from your day job and then do more animation. So, yeah, it took about a year, but, like, I kind of think with personal projects, you should only work on them when you want to work on them or else what's the point? I mean, it should be like a fun kind of exploration. So I didn't want to force myself to work on it when I didn't feel like it. So yeah, really, if I was working on it full time, it could have, should have taken maybe three or four months, I'd imagine. How do you stay motivated <laughs> across a year? I didn't. Like, so there were a whole month. I mean, say from September till November, I didn't really touch it. That was a whole two months I didn't touch it. And I kind of started to resent it at that point because it's like this burden on your back that you just can't, I mean, I'd invested so much time in it already, so it was a waste not to finish it, but then I didn't really want to finish it because like, things like my original style frames just weren't like sexy to me anymore. They weren't really like appealing, so yeah, it's really hard to kind of like push yourself to, to work on it, but you just plow on and do it like bit by bit. But yeah, definitely there's like a burst of like progress at the beginning, and then I kind of think there is at the end as well when you're on the final stretch, but that middle chunk is like a big slump where it's just very slow working. Yeah. The middle chunk of eight months. Yeah, yeah, I think. <laughs> Let's go back to the beginning of, of where it actually started. Where did the idea come from? It kind of started when uh, I was kind of inspired by a song called, um, what's it called? You Don't Know by Ellie Greenwich. You don't know what happened. Going through since the day I eyes on you. It's about a love triangle between her and another woman and a man. And I love the song first of all. It's real the real like kind of sixties and almost like Motown kind of vibe. And then uh but also I think it's really interesting because it has these really like sad and lonely lyrics, but then in contrast with that, the music is really upbeat and cheerful and happy. And I kind of, I really, I was really interested in that dynamic, the kind of contrast between happiness and sadness. And I think that's really, um, like typical of that era of most like music and film and TV and everything. Everything was portrayed as being this like kind of shiny and perfect. And there's no such thing as like a bad relationship in the world because all couples on TV were these like sickly sweet, like Brady Bunch families or whatever. So I really like the idea of setting a, a kind of a sad story or kind of a morbid story in a time that's so often portrayed as being perfect and kind of rose tinted and stuff. So yeah, it kind of originally came from that song. And you should, if you haven't heard that song, you should listen to it. It's really, really nice. do a project I have a very specific objective and for this one I wanted to do something completely different to the last project I worked in and that's usually the case so if I work on something like really long I want to do something short and if I work on something really short I want to do something long and kind of do the opposite sort of design style as well so like I made a short film 
the year before last called Snowfall. And I wanted to I wanted to just change up my design style completely and kind of push myself a little bit because when you work on something like that for so long, you get really fixed in a certain design style and all the characters I was drawing looked the exact same and all the backgrounds started to just look the exact same. So I really kind of like stepped out of my comfort zone a little bit when I'm designing style frames and things. And kind of simultaneously, I was working on a storyboard, which I'll show you here. So like, this is how I usually start. I do really messy text storyboards and without kind of work, like without kind of drawing down the camera angles or the, exactly what shots I needed or whatever. It's more just what events need to happen for the story to be told. And then from there, I'm kind of working on character designs and looks. Um, usually in Photoshop or Illustrator or something. So then the text storyboard gets replaced with that stuff, which is more, oh, like it yeah. still probably makes no sense to you because I never intended to show this to anyone. But, uh, <laughs> but it's more just kind of to work out like what shots are missing, you know, for the story to be told. And it's, that's always like the most informative part of the process. You know, and when you put it into an animatic and you work out, you work out how long the timings need to be. And I actually really enjoy that part. Um, and then from there, it's kind of just about working up style frames, kind of finished look frames. And that's really fun as well because it's so new and fresh and like you can kind of see the film as a viewer would see it for the first time. And then after that, it's just about making it and, make <laughs> and, and filling in the gaps. So like even like in the animatic, I'd have finished shots and then the next shot would be still a sketch, like a scan sketch. So I'd have to work on that one. So and slowly the holes become, the gaps become closer and closer until it's all fully finished shots. I love that you're starting with the story, which might sound ridiculous, but like it's not that you thought, oh, do you know what, this shot would look really nice, and then you came up with a story just to put a load of shots together. There which... is that. I'm not... Ah, <laughs> go on then. Which... I'm not... I'm not... I'm not... <laughs> <laughs> like, there are definitely shots that I want to do and I'm thinking like oh how can I fit that into a story and that's really like yeah that's kind of a chicken and egg situation it's a bit of both so things where you've you've been experimenting and thought man I really want to do that was yeah, it the one with the cigarette look at my yeah that cigarette with the like her and her in kind of negative space against the rain I really wanted to do yeah and I just wanted to do like really dark moody shots like I love really dark kind of like cinematic you know, film noir shots where everything is just so dramatic and like sexy and I just wanted to do a, like an animation full of that and like one, one of the shots actually that I really wanted to do from the beginning and it's actually not even my favorite shot of the thing now but I just really wanted to do it was the one where she's walking towards the house and the camera is following her from behind but it's kind of handheld, like it's going up and down. But initially when I'd imagined that, I had, I thought that she would be all black, kind of silhouetted against the glow from the house. But I tried it out and it didn't look as nice and I actually made her orange then. But it's funny just how those shots changed. Like some of the shots that inspired me to make it probably just didn't end up in the cut for whatever reason, they didn't fit. So it kind of changes as you, as you work and then you find out what works and what doesn't work. <laughs> It's interesting because looking at the storyboard uh, picture that we've got here, you know, you can see some of them are clearly just sketches. They look like they're sketched yeah. by hand. Uh, some of them look like you've actually started to create individual frames, I guess, you know, actual pictures of what are very closely matched to the final. Yeah, and I guess that's kind of the beauty of working by yourself because... There's no, I mean, if you like something, then there's no, it's not contested, you know, it's part of a group where I think when you're working by yourself, you kind of, I don't know, once an idea is locked in, it's not very likely to change as you go on. But even in that storyboard, you, you can see my, like I started out drawing things that were quite close to final frames. That's the storyboard progresses. The drawings get rougher and rougher and rougher just because I was like impatient. I wanted to get started on it. So I was like, who am I making this storyboard for? I think like it's really important to make a very clear storyboard when you're working as part of a group and you need to delegate scenes and shots to people. 
but when you're making it for yourself it's kind of like yeah that squiggle represents a person and and that's fine. That's adequate for now. But I had the best of intentions at the start of that swear word, and then it just went downhill. Um, also, that's you've very... got you've got the writing on there, so we can see like slow dolly in on the basement mm-hmm. scene and stuff. So you're you're really thinking about all of those at this stage. Yeah, yeah. Like I, it's important to think about those camera moves, um, because if I didn't think about them at that stage, then what would end up happening is I'd have two shots that have the same camera move, where camera moves that like conflict with each other. And so I'm kind of trying to think about that stuff and work all that stuff out earlier, as opposed to finding out later when I put the edit all together. I'm like, oh, that shot doesn't work for like that shot. And I have to fix it. And it's rather just get it all sorted out and ironed out in the beginning. And it also means that when you come to do stuff like, you know, some of the beautiful transitions or the, oh, I don't know, what, it's a long time since I did any film studying and even then I wasn't paying attention. Match the it. match cuts. There you go. The match cuts, like the beautiful of that era of, of the films, yeah. for that matter. Um, yeah, so some of those you're thinking right at this stage. Yeah, I knew the match cuts were going to be really important because... Like I was saying that I wanted to experiment with the design style, I also really wanted to experiment with the edit of it. Um, and for me, like I think the narrative of, and here's the spoiler, I think the narrative of a woman like murdering her abusive husband isn't that new or that innovative. It's kind of like a cinematic trope and I get that and it's referential and I like that. But what really appealed to me was the was that the whole thing was building towards a climax, not of her killing him, but of her remembering that they were once happy because when we first see their relationship it's bad right she's she's seeing him cheating but we'll talk about that later and uh but i like that the twist isn't that she kills him it's that they were actually happy ones and i think that's kind of like representative of a lot of abusive relationships as well where it's kind of like a stockholm syndrome sort of thing but um so that was what was initially appealing to me so to get back to, to the point i was making was I thought the match cuts are really important because the edit jumps around so much in time and in like different flashbacks and things. I just didn't want to confuse the viewer any more than I wanted to. If you know what I mean, like that was something I didn't want to. I didn't want people to be saying, "Hang, is that the same person? Is that the blah 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 blah?" blah. <laughs> so the idea of using match cuts was just to say it is the same person, and that's why I kind of gave her that um, very recognizable scar on her cheek. You know, so you can tell who's who in each shot because the characters are quite minimal otherwise and it could be easily confused at someone else. The other thing we can see at this stage is where it's called Avenging Angel. That wasn't actually my title. That was a, a conveniently appropriate title actually as well, but it was from this book, Typography from the 60s and 70s and they're often TV shows and, ah. uh, and films and stuff and I think Avenging Angel is a film that exists. I don't know, but I, re- I knew I wanted to do type like that and I kind of thought it was an appropriate title as well. That was just literally bunged in for the story word to give it um to give an idea of what the title might be like. Um, but yeah, okay, I went yeah. through went through a million titles as I I love this in your sketchbook where it's like uh it's a bit like somebody writing out their signature when they were a kid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or f- figuring right. out who they're gonna marry or something like that. Or like it's... red rum all over the wall or something. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I can imagine that that looks a little bit psychotic on the outside, but it's an important part of the process. There is more, there is more like finished ones, I guess. Yeah. yeah, the name changed a lot, and like the working title was Ellie because it was kind of inspired by that Ellie Greenwich song, and also because I studied because what I did in college was graphic design. That I put a lot of emphasis on that, and I considered a lot, um, like the typography. I mean, so like the reason I sketched that out a million times was because. There's something about like um, handwritten type that it's kind of a, I don't know, you might only get it right once out of a hundred times because of a certain loop or a certain twist. You can't really draw it slowly. You kind of have to like push through it. Um, and then I don't even think I used any of those in the end. Yeah, because I changed the name in the end to My Darling Shadow, like the very, very end. <laughs> but that was all informative process, so it's fine. Hope you're enjoying this conversation. If you are, then subscribe to Red Lemon TV on YouTube. Also to Red Lemon at the website with the newsletter, helping you be more creative and also to make more money and be happier as a business creative as well. Well worth checking out. My name, by the way, is Steve Folland and I host a podcast called Being Freelance, where I chat to different freelance creatives every single week about 
well, being freelance. So if you're into this kind of thing, if you are a freelance creative, please find us as well, beingfreelance.com and the, or, or take a look on iTunes. Being Freelance is the podcast where I chat to people each week. All right. Let's get back, though, to this chat. I always think it's easier to work in black and white first. I know some people don't, but for me, I just think it's easier to work in black and white first to work at the form and the... And the compositions, because like there's so many composition kind of rules. I mean, they're not rules, more like guidelines, sure. But there's a lot of composition kind of um, techniques that I really wanted to work on as well. And I was like reading a lot about composition and converging lines, pointing towards the subject and how to draw um, people's attention to certain areas of the frame. So I really wanted to kind of learn a bit about that as well and work on that. And then color kind of came after that. And I wanted a really limited color palette because um again kind of just i wanted a real like kind of 60s 70s color palette and if you ever look at photos i have pinterest boards full of 70s interiors and it's all like orange and brown and these weird like olive greens and it's so funny because those colors would be considered actually they're probably coming back in fashion now but they're kind of gross now for interiors so i wanted to kind of reflect that in in the animation itself so there's loads of oranges actually just looking at it now and that kind of weird kind of almost sickly olive green and loads of like black and everything as well. So yeah, it's kind of just about getting the mood of the piece to match the colors, or to get the colors to match the mood, you know. And then do so you go it. through it, animating it uh, in order <clears throat> chronologically, or are you going? Do you know what? I really want to do this bit first. I'll do that bit. I do. Often I leave the most difficult shots to the end because I think by then I'm kind of like in the zone and I can do it. So I start off with usually the. Not the simplest, but the least tricky, I'd say. Um, and also, yeah, there is a certain element of like, oh, I don't feel very motivated this week, so I'll work on a shot that I really want to work on. And then I'll save the kind of the more tedious shots that are kind of necessary to tell the story but aren't really that fun to animate. Um, you should save them for the day when I'm feeling really enthusiastic and happy and able to work on stuff. But uh, yeah, so like some... And some shots take a lot longer than others, particularly the, the cell animated ones. Like, I'd never really animated hands before, and it's a minefield. So I had to take so many reference videos of, like, my friends and, and myself, like, opening door handles and looking up how people do it. And it's the sort of thing that you do instinctively, open a door handle. But when you try and think about how you open a door handle, <laughs> it changes completely. It looks like, I don't know, it was a nightmare trying to do that. But again, it's really, like, I'm really pleased with how it turned out, and I, like, I'll see learned a bit about it so now I'm less daunted by the idea of animating hands. So when you're saying cell animation that would be the more sort of traditional sort of frame by frame? Yeah I mean cell is probably the wrong term to use because cell I think is on actual traditional plastic cell but um, it's kind of just a catch-all term for a frame by frame animation. So I do that with the Wacom on the computer using TV paint. So how much of this is frame by frame um it's kind of mixed like it's kind of mixed media so say like the shots where the shot at the beginning where the couple where he kind of runs around the car and runs up to the door and they kind of embrace that's cell animated and a lot of the kind of excuse me a lot of the kind of wide character shots would be cell animated whereas a lot of the close-ups would be a little bit mixed and again that was another thing i kind of decided at the beginning when i was determining the style I wanted a really mixed media effect, so I wanted like really sharp, hard vector lines combined with kind of more hand-drawn, like humanistic, um, rough kind of boiling lines that jitter, and then also to throw in kind of that that grain texture, which I use a lot throughout, it, and um, the kind of painterly texture as well, which are all just like Photoshop brushes, brushworks. I made a load of animated textures at the beginning and then used them throughout the piece. Um, so yeah, I'd say about I don't know, thirty percent of it is. Is, is like frame by frame animated and um, like sometimes like on the close-up of Ellie let's call her um, like her face might be a vector shape done in After Effects but then her eyes and maybe her like her lips and her ears might be um, cell animated and they you can tell because it's really obvious because they boil and kind of jump around the place whereas the vector lines stay solid and all the hand animation as well is um, frame by frame the software involved is After mm -hmm. Effects. After Effects would be the main chunk of it, and there's TV Paint, which I did for the, which I used for the cell, or not the cell, the frame by frame animation, and 
I think that's it. Yeah, just those two. Oh, actually, there's a little bit of 3D. Um, that ring spinning, like when the, the camera's uh, zooming in on the ring spinning on the table, that was just a simulation I did in Cinema 4D with the, the, an actual ring and then spun it around because I wasn't bothered animating that. So, uh, <laughs> and also, like, Cinema 4D can do it better than I can. That ring sequence is mm -hmm. a nice jumping point, actually, into talking about the sound. Oh, uh, yeah. Because, you know, this is, it's a stunningly beautiful th uh, film to watch. But part of that as well is the soundscape that's been created. Yeah. And that's a collaboration, right? Uh, yeah. So I worked with um, Fab Martini, who has the most amazing name. Yes. <laughs> he's, this, uh, he's this Italian sound designer who... I worked with before on my short film Snowfall and he did an amazing job then and I really wanted to get him again to work on this so he like kindly did it for me and then um, yeah he's really great to work with because he like a lot of the time I didn't really know what this stuff was going to sound like I mean I think it, with Snowfall it was a little more kind of abstract the sound um, and he was really good at interpreting that and kind of giving his own input and coming up with new sounds that I just didn't expect And he's always got like great opinions that sometimes I might resist initially because it's not exactly how I imagined it, but then it always works out for the best. Because and it's really great to have a sound designer like that that I know I can trust because he really knows his stuff. Like say for example the the, the shot where they're dancing and kind of spinning around. I knew I wanted some sort of really kind of reverby song playing in the background, but he kind of. I didn't actually think it would be the song that I used throughout it, but he kind of suggested that, and I think that works really well because it actually makes the story clearer. It kind of adds another layer to the story. Like maybe the song, the reason that we're hearing the song throughout the entire piece is because it was their song, you know, like their couple of songs, and maybe it was their anniversary or their wedding night or whatever, and they played that song. So that was really nice. And then he kind of added those um, kind of jingles, kind of like the glittery jingles. I don't even know how to describe them in that shot as well. And it kind of works really nicely with the, the kind of sparkles that are flooded, like zooming past the camera in the foreground. So, um, yeah, it's really, really exciting to get that stuff back. And, like, the first thing I heard was that opening scene with the car driving up and the car door slamming and the rain and the lightning and stuff. And I've been watching that silent for a year, so to see it with sound and, like, completely brought to life, I was just like, oh, my God, finish it. So I want to I hear the rest of it right now. So it was really cool. I really like working with them, and I hope to work with them again. If he doesn't get too famous. How did you guys come to work together in the first place? For, for uh, we actually just met through Vimeo. Uh, I think oh, wow. he had messaged me on Vimeo like before I'd made Snowfall or anything, and said that he's a sound designer, and if I had any projects that needed sound design, and I was like, "Yep, yeah, please, please do." Um, I love Vimeo for that because I actually met a couple of people through Vimeo. It's like a really nice community. And I don't know, like, I was kind of surprised. I went to um, the US there earlier in the year and I was speaking to a couple of animators there and most of them were like, oh, no, I don't have Vimeo. I have all my stuff on YouTube. And I was like, get on Vimeo. It's so good because the community is just really, really nice and really supportive and you genuinely make friends there. And everyone, there's so many amazing artists that put up their personal work there. And it's like a really great space. So I really love Vimeo for that. And I wouldn't have met him if it wasn't for that. So That's awesome. Some of my old projects on Vimeo are actually awful, and I think I'm embarrassed to look at them. But I kind of feel it's important to put them up there because it's really heartening for me to see, like, animators and designers that I like, and then I look back through their videos, and some of them are really bad at the beginning. It kind of shows that like everyone comes from humble roots, I guess. And um, so I kind of keep those up there as a reminder of that.
Now, it is a, a solo project, a club collaboration at the end mm. for the sound, which, you know, make, makes it so beautiful. <laughs> but there are other names there, which makes it... Yeah. Are they simply as hand models? Or <laughs> uh, what, yeah. what, what, what are those other names then? It's really important to get other people's perspectives on things when you're working on them by yourself because you can work yourself into believing that something is good or not good or like I obviously understand the story because I made it but it's um it's really helpful for me to get other people's opinion it's usually towards the end of the project and so I'd show it to people and not tell them about it. a couple of friends who are really good at this sort of thing so their feedback was really really helpful and they're actually they're all the people I thank in that um, special thanks bit um so say for example uh, like shots there's the shot where we see her at the sink and in the final version now there's kind of like a trickle of blood under her eye and she's like quite bruised around here and stuff and even though it is still subtle um, that wasn't there before they had suggested it because before I just had the scar and I said to them I was like oh do you what do you notice about this shot does she look beaten up or does she look like she's been in a fight and like no I don't get that at all and I was like okay great I know that in my head so now I have to make it more obvious for you uh... And also the initial sink shot as well, um, when you're like kind of the top down view of the sink, it is really abstract and it's kind of about finding that balance. Like I want it to be abstract, but I don't want it to be completely illegible. So I asked them, like I'd pause it on that shot and say, what is this? Do you know what this is? And they didn't know until the end when she pulled the knife out. So I had to go back and make it look more like a sink. So I changed the taps and I changed, like if you look actually at the color story, but the taps are different, her arms are different put in ripples and stuff i still think it is kind of abstract and you might not get it the first time but it's less so than it was before so i think that's they're really they're, it's just a really it's really good to have a sounding board that you can kind of bounce those ideas off and get a fresh perspective on something that you've been looking at for so long those sorts of things and like saying like oh this shot was too quick could it be longer i didn't really have time to register what was on the screen so that's the sort of stuff that you're blind to when you work on it for so long just so, yeah. something i was wondering was that um do you make scenes deliberately longer and then like you know like you would actually filming a film mm. or are you really rigid as in you, you know so that you could cut out a scene quicker or yeah. recut it when the music is in there and yeah i tend not to because it's more work but uh <laughs> i yeah you you kind of hope that that stuff is locked down when you make the animatic that's just the the like the sequence of those still sketches and the kind of color story but stuff so you kind of hope that, they're, that it works. But sometimes when you do the animation and you kind of put in the character walking across the frame, you realize that it's actually not nearly enough time. So it's kind of like you play it as, play it as you go, basically. It's only kind of painful to extend the shot when you're doing that frame-by-frame frame stuff because you're like, oh, my God, I think extra 30 <laughs> drawings now, like when I thought I was done. But um, and actually, maybe what's more painful is cutting a shot that's frame-by-frame frame because you're wasting all those frames that you drew. But uh, yeah, there were times when I had to extend stuff, like uh, the shot of the ring spinning. That was way too quick in the animatics. But when I put the when I put the ring into it, it yeah, it just seemed way too quick. So I had to extend that. And yeah, you kind of play it by ear. And then also, like the song is kind of important as well to hit certain beats in the song and to work out. <laughs> I don't know, like final grade, I guess. Like, because when I have those shots in, they're just block solid colors, but then I kind of add gradient and effects. And I, I wanted the final grade to look like, not like an old VHS, but, but really um, cinematic. I mean, the whole thing is quite a reference to film noir and those old kind of cinema, cinematic pieces. But so I wanted that letterbox. Like, I deliberately put it in a 69, 16 9 frame and then put in the black bars because I wanted the light to, to leak around those black bars. And if you actually look at it, there's kind of glow that goes past the the letterbox frame, which is like two, three, five to one or something like that. Um, so yeah, I, and the grade, I kind of wanted it to be kind of flickery and grainy and to kind of have that kind of old feel. Cause I like that contrast with the sharp vector shapes of the characters and some of the more graphic um, designs with the backgrounds and stuff. Um, yeah, that was kind of my thinking for grade. Man, no wonder it took you so long. Yeah, well, I was very lazy as well, but yeah. No, you see, I, I, I don't think you should be allowed to use the word lazy because nobody who creates something like this is lazy. Well, thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> full stop. So, Somebody who goes to work, does a full day's work and then manages, it doesn't matter how long it takes them to create something yeah. like this is not lazy. Um, 
hopefully it also means you've got a life <laughs> amongst yeah, everything. Oh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, because I, like, yeah, it's, I think that's really important as well because sometimes you can spend so long working on something and then realise that you haven't been, like, you haven't been out for a drink in, like, three weeks or something. So, yeah, I always kind of prioritise life over this stuff, although I love this as well. So, I mean, the dream is someday to be able to do this as my day job, you know, to, like, work on short films and things as my day job. But um, I can't see a viable way of doing that at the moment. Because, I mean, you, a lot of people, to do it, you'd be kind of living from grant to grant or looking for funding from various film boards and stuff. And it is really difficult. Like, I have friends who do it. And the payoff is that they get to work on their, their dream projects, their personal projects for their job. But then the downside is that they just not as much job security in it. And, and I think that's very important as well for living a comfortable life to have job security. So, I don't know. It's a... It's, um, bit about this pros and cons the the detail uh, and the care that you've taken over it really shines through though how what does it feel like when you start getting the reaction from it you know when you hit publish it's great it's like the best day ever <laughs> so it's cool because again it kind of goes back to what i was saying about just not having a fresh perspective on it when you see people that react to it and react well to it and um, it's really nice because it kind of affirms your initial taste like when when i designed those style frames initially i think like oh my god this is sexy i love this like i only want to work on this but it's really it's really a sad thing when you kind of fall out of love with the initial style frames um but then when you have people reacting nicely to it it's really good it's a really nice feeling and i'm sure i'll come back around to loving it again it'll just take a little while i think but uh yeah no it's great and like it was a vimeo staff pick which is really cool and it's had lots of views and stuff, which is really nice. It's like encouraging because it makes you want to make more stuff now. Even though I know you shouldn't make stuff for the for people's nice comments, but it's certainly like <laughs> certainly one one encouragement, I guess. So, Connor, thank you so much and all the best for the future. We look forward to it. Thank you very much. See ya.